There was a time in nearly every racing series where it was possible for a clever outsider to build a car, compete, and sometimes win. This time has long since passed in most of the major series, either explicitly prohibited by the rules or just impossible because of the money involved. This is kind of a bummer because competition makes things more interesting. If any kid in his garage can compete in your industry, you have to be consistently good. And if you're in an industry with an impossibly high barrier to entry, you end up with United Airlines. Gross. Some of the best racing series are the ones that are still accessible to the privateers, the people building racing machines in their garages with their money, supported by friends and the sponsors brave enough to help the little guy. The Pikes Peak Hill Climb is one of those places. Sure, you hear about the factory teams, the Bentleys, the Ducatis, the Porsches, but most of the drivers, and sometimes the fastest drivers, are not here due to the permission of the marketing department of Automotive Inc. They're just here because they love it. In 2018, the Pikes Peak Hill Climb was won by one of the largest automotive manufacturers in the world, Volkswagen. They dumped millions of dollars and countless hours into designing, testing, and developing one of the most advanced racing vehicles on the planet. Two vehicles, actually. They brought a whole separate car just in case. The next year, the event was won by Robin. Robin Shoot is not a global auto manufacturing company worth $150 billion, but he is no slouch. He's a professional automotive engineer and a truly impressively talented racing driver. He also has a team helping him run the car, a team that calls themselves the Sendy Club, because they always send it. Full send. But the team is not a factory-backed effort, expensing hotel rooms and inviting celebrities into their paddock. They all took time off of work to sleep on couches and air mattresses for a few hours each night before waking up at 3 a.m. to help shoot send it up the mountain. Most of them work in auto racing or at car companies. They know what they're doing. This event, however, is not for a paycheck. This event is for the love of racing. This past weekend, I joined up with the Cindy Club, turning a couple of wrenches, listening to their war stories, and asking all about their secrets of speed, which I will share with you later on in this video. Just remember, these are secrets, so don't tell anyone. I arrived on the Thursday before race day, greeted by a cloudy sky and a rain-covered mountain. About that time, Robin was on the mountain, sending it up the hill in the rain for qualifying. There were a few cars that got a dry qualifying run, but Robin pulled in the fastest time of the unlimited class. There are several different classes at Pikes Peak, Open Wheel, Exhibition, Time Attack 1 for production-based vehicles, and of course the unlimited class, which is the purpose-built racing vehicles, and almost always the fastest. Anyway, I landed, picked up my rental RAV4, and drove to my 1960s-themed hotel. Wait, is this hotel 60s-themed, or was it just built in the 60s and never updated? Hmm. I set my alarm clock and got a full three and a half hours of sleep. Remember when I said that the team was waking up at 3 a.m.? Well, that's not an exaggeration. All the practice and qualifying takes place early in the morning. The gates open at 3.30 a.m. for competitors to get in and set up their paddock before practice begins at 5.30 a.m. So at about 4 a.m., I drove up a moonlit mountain behind a short line of cars. I don't think I've ever woken up at 3 a.m. Like, I've been awake at 3 a.m., but I don't think I've ever started my day at 3 a.m. The Sendy Club was already set up with their car unloaded and the tires wrapped in electric heaters. They were all much more awake than I was. They had been getting up at 3 a.m. every day since Tuesday, and they were not especially sympathetic to my weariness. The cold morning slowly gave way to sunrise, and I was greeted by a beautiful mountain and the serene sounds of nature. So, how's the week been going? I asked. Not great, apparently. Ideally, the car would have arrived at least a couple of weeks before the event, with plenty of time to button everything up, get it on the high-altitude dyno, and hopefully take it around the local test track for some shakedown. Well, apparently, global shipping has kind of been a disaster for the past several months, and the car had to be shipped all the way from... here. Shoot is British, though he resides in the States now, but he and his car were back in England just prior to the race, so international shipping was a necessary problem to be solved. Interestingly, Shoot was the first Brit to win Pikes Peak outright, which is a little surprising since hill climb racing is a popular sport in England, and Pikes Peak is probably the most famous hill climb race in the world. The car did show up thanks to a lot of phone calls and string pulling, but it was late. This became a much bigger problem when the team found out that the engine had a cracked block. 
A spare engine was put on the truck and rushed out from California to be installed in the car. So basically the engine turned up 3 p.m. on the Saturday. We got that in. The car together enough to go on the dyno. So we then sort of di started dynoing around 11.30, 12 p.m., you know, midnight. And then we dynoed through till about 4 a.m. Went back for a bit of sleep. And the team came back, put together the rest of the car in the morning. And then we went out to La Junta to test in the afternoon. So we'd gone from a tub and a car in pieces to dyno tuned and shaken down, fully shaken down, ready for the race in about 24 hours. After a day of tuning at the local racetrack, the car arrived on the mountain for the first day of practice. For the practice and qualifying days, the mountain is split up into sections. The cars alternate sections each day so they can all get a chance to tune and test on different corners and at different altitudes. The team had updated the car in a few important ways since their last win in 2019. A turbocharger from Borg Warner was installed. I asked the question we're all wondering, how much power do you get from a new turbocharger? So the new turbo was supposed to give us 50 horsepower less, but it looks like we've ended up with 50 horsepower more. Okay, now I have two questions. How did you end up with 50 more and why were you aiming for less? We put that down to kind of two main things. First of all, the new fuel. Um, which I think has unlocked a lot of potential in the car. We've gone from uh, a gasoline to an E85 fuel. And then the second thing is the turbo inlet air filter, which most people don't really pay much attention to, but at altitude, it makes a huge difference. You know, having a tiny filter versus a big filter can rob you 100 horsepower. As for why they were looking for less horsepower, that comes down to drivability and area under the curve. You're not always at one RPM making peak horsepower all the time. You're shifting gears and sweeping through a range of RPMs. So your average horsepower you're actually using might be more for an engine tuned for less peak power. Also, the car might be more drivable with a flatter power curve. This is especially true with turbocharged engines, doubly so with the very turbocharged engines you see on the mountain. If you have a turbo screaming at top speed and then you let off the throttle, hit the brakes and go into a corner, you don't want your turbo to not be spinning when you exit the corner. Your engine that was sucking in 400 liters of air every second is now struggling to pull in a third of that, drastically reducing your power output and making you lose. So sometimes less power is better power. The team is putting down around 600 horsepower at the base of the mountain and closer to 500 at the top. This may not seem like much in a world where every other car has 700 horsepower, but it is plenty and I will get into why in just a moment. Once the team had swapped the engine and made it to practice day on the mountain, things started to come together. There were a few small hiccups, a loose GPS sensor knocked off their water pump belt during a run. That's fine, that's why you have practice days. By the time I arrived on Friday, the team had sorted most of the car. They did five practice runs to adjust the fuel map and let Robin get a little more comfortable with the middle section of the mountain. There were also a couple of small things that cropped up, as there always are. The gear shift indicator was giving some unexpected readings. They ran new wires and crimped a new connector just to be safe. They also had a small problem with their tire warmers getting too hot. Tire warmers are important because these tires, like most racing tires, are designed to be their stickiest at high temperatures. Once you're on the track and moving, the tires are warm. Today they're practicing the middle section, and so during the race the tires will be fully up to temperature at this point, so to get useful practice the tires need to be hot. So they wrap the tires in electric tire warmers, wrap the warmers in blankets, and then crank the heat all the way up. This was a bit too much for the warmers, slightly melting them, but they still worked, so that's good. After practice, we took the car back down the mountain to the shop. A list was made and the final prep started. Bleed the brakes, change the gearbox fluid, clean the car, check the heat exchangers, etc. Weather reports were worrying, it was looking like it might be snowing the night before the race and again on race day. When the weather gets bad, they'll often close the top of the mountain and end the race at a lower point, running only three quarters of a race. There's still a race, but it's a little disappointing because so many people are trying to break a record. Pikes Peak is possibly the most challenging race in the world. There are longer auto races, faster courses, and series with stiffer competition. But there are a few things that make this hill climb uniquely challenging. It is a complicated course. It has 156 turns over 12 miles. Many of the corners are blind and difficult to tell apart. The start of the race is 1.8 miles above sea level. 
It winds through the trees, past the tree line, up into the clouds, ending at just over 14,000 feet at the top of the tallest mountain on the southern front range of the Rocky Mountains. At the start of the race, your 850 horsepower car is only putting out 600, and by the end, you're in the low 500s. It's a unique challenge to build an engine for the thin air, and another to tune it for the change in pressure from the bottom to the top. This is especially challenging because you can't just rent out the course to tune your car. You get three practice days a year, for three hours in the early morning each on only a fraction of the course. That's for tuning, testing, and driver practice. Make sure your driver gets lots of time on Gran Turismo. The course is also unpredictable. Weather conditions on the mountain can go from hot and sunny to freezing hail with little warning, and fog creeps in and out, confusing and blinding the already difficult course. Many of the wrecks are the result of a driver mistaking one blind corner for a blind straight, going into a hairpin at wide open throttle, and sending it into the trees. Or worse. Most drivers run with supplemental oxygen. Driving a race car up this hill is intense exercise, and the lack of oxygen at the top can lead to a dangerous loss of focus. And if all that wasn't enough, this year, part of the pits had to be closed because a family of bears showed up. Some of the corners have a tiny bit of runoff. Some have short sections of rusty barriers, but much of the course is open to the trees, the rocks, and the cliffs. Driving a race car takes talent, but driving a race car at Pikes Peak takes a unique talent, a focus, discipline, courage, and self-awareness that makes these drivers undeniably elite. Also kind of insane. Just a little bit. The quickest anyone has ever driven up the mountain was in that Volkswagen I talked about earlier, piloted by Romain Dumas. He made the trek in 7 minutes and 57 seconds. The first car to make it to the top was driven by William Wayne Brown in 1913, who took a bit longer at just under five and a half hours. Back then, none of the road was paved. In fact, much of it could barely be called a road. Just three years later, the road had been widened into the Pikes Peak Highway, and the first race was held, with Rhea Lentz crossing the finish line the quickest time of 20 minutes and 55 seconds. The race skipped three years after the first event due to some shenanigans by the Germans, and again in the early 1940s due to some more shenanigans by the Germans. Other than that, the event has run continuously. This year was the 99th running. Times have gotten better over the years, in part due to technological improvements, and in part due to the adding of pavement to the course. The first year of full pavement was in 2012, when Reese Millen set a record of 9 minutes and 46 seconds. But perhaps the most impressive record was set the next year, when Sebastian Loeb absolutely destroyed that record, reaching the top over a minute and a half faster than anyone else had ever done. Over the last few years, overall times have slowed a bit. Major construction of a new summit complex has resulted in severe damage to the pavement at the top. One of the drivers I talked to said he estimated the damage to the road at the top is causing a full 10 extra seconds of time. <laughs> 2018 was the Cindy Club's first year, and like many rookie teams, they didn't make it to the finish line. Racing is hard. The following year, they made up for it by being the fastest car on the mountain. They won outright, and Shoot was king of the mountain. Their practice times were looking even more impressive this year, and so I wanted to know their secrets. So I wired Robin Shoot up with the microphone and asked him to share all his secrets of speed. Just to put it in my butt Here. somehow. There you go. Cool. All right. We focus on basically being really, really light, uh, having lots of mechanical tire grip, uh, lots of downforce, and then just a little bit of power, or just enough power. When I say a little bit, it's still 600 horsepower, it's still a lot of horsepower, but um, it isn't these thousand horsepower numbers you see others running with claiming. I also asked Shoot's co-owner, Matt Sampson, the same question, and he said something similar. Number one is show up, number two, finish, and number three is be quick. Lightweight is the key. Big wings, as you can see from the back end now. Mm -hmm. And just really making it reliable, finishing. Based on these answers and my interpretation of them, I'm going to make the hierarchy of speed. At the top, we have show up. Next, we have finish, which I'm going to call reliability. And finally, we have be quick. Under be quick, we're gonna put in order of importance, first lightweight, then grip, both mechanical and aerodynamic, and finally, just enough power. We'll start with the first two, show up and finish. This seems obvious, but I assure you that it takes a certain level of experience to appreciate the difficulty of just showing up to the race with the car, much less completing the race. 
Everyone has lofty goals of building, updating, and testing their vehicles, and very often people don't make it past the first part of that. Here's what happens. You look at your plan and you say, I think it will take me four months to build this car, and the race is five months away, so we're good. What you should say is, I think it will take me four months to build this car, which means it will take me 12 months to build this car. Also, I will need at least five months of testing and tuning, so I might be able to make next year's race. Any and all race car projects are subject to the rule of pi. The rule of pi goes like this. If you think it will take you a month to do something, it will actually take you 3.14 months. And if that project budget is $1,000, you can expect to be out $3,140 in the end. This goes for testing time as well, even more so. Testing is when the unknown unknowns start showing up, all that stuff you didn't plan for. The really evil part of the rule of pi is that it's hard to plan in. Once you update your schedule to be 3.14 months long, your project will now take 10 months. You have to plan for one month and then expect to be done two months before the race, then you'll just barely finish in time. What is the number one thing you need to make a car go fast? A lot of people will say, lots of power. Ask the same question to race car engineers and you'll get a different answer. Basically being really, really light. Lightweight is the key. Low weight. Horsepower is good, it is important, but in most racing series, at least most of them where you have to slow down and turn, it comes further down the list. This car has a thousand horsepower, twice what Shoot has in his car. It will be slower by a lot. How can I be sure that a car with double the horsepower will be slower? Because it is a fatty. Nearly two and a half tons of car. And while that might not matter out here, it matters a lot when you encounter one of these. And one of these. And Pikes Peak has lots of both of those. Big horsepower numbers will help you accelerate if you can put the power down. Big brakes will help you slow down if you have the grip. But low mass will help you accelerate and help you slow down and help you go around corners faster. It will help the car rotate quicker. It will reduce stress on the components, allowing you to make them lighter. Lightweight enough to lift the entire car with an engine hoist on its lowest setting. Less weight begets less weight. Big cars need big brakes. Look at these brakes, reasonably sized. They are the size of one Zack head. Compare that to the Porsche brakes, which are at least three Zack heads in diameter. A lightweight car can use smaller brakes. Smaller brakes are lightweight. Win-win. The best way to reduce the weight of a component is not to make it out of titanium or to redesign it in carbon fiber. The best way to reduce the mass of a component is to make it not be there. If it absolutely needs to be there, it should just barely be there. This is engineering. Lots of people can build a bridge that won't collapse, but it takes an engineer to build a bridge that just barely won't collapse. Lots of people can build a race car, but it takes a team of engineers to just barely build a race car. To build a barely race car. After light weighting your car as much as engineeringly possible, your next task is to make it stick. This is where the tires and suspension come in. Shoot swears by these, so for your tires, go to Pirelli, slide them some cash across the counter, and ask for these. Suspension setup is a little more difficult, especially these past few years with the rough condition of the road. The road is mostly smooth, but there are a few bumps, especially at the top. The Sendy Club uses a three-spring setup to keep their tires planted in the corners while making sure the aerodynamic downforce doesn't keep the suspension from doing its job. The suspension has to work with the wings, not against them. Aerodynamic downforce is a huge advantage on the mountain, more so than pretty much anywhere else. The importance of downforce is pretty clear with a quick glance around the paddock. Nowhere else will you see such prodigious diffusers. Wait, am I using that word right? Prodigious, prodigious. Remarkably or impressively good. Yeah, prodigious diffusers, inordinate rear wings, and thesaurus front splitters. You don't usually see giant wings in other forms of motorsports because lots of downforce usually means lots of drag to slow you down. But here, drag doesn't matter as much as it does in some other places. For every pound of downforce you add, you can add two pounds of drag and you'll still be better off. This is because there are so many slow, tight corners. The chassis of this car is a Wolf prototype sports car, but the wings are special for Pike's Peak, hanging way off the front and back, adding five feet to the length of the vehicle. Power is not the most important thing, but it is important. There are lazy ways to make power, just ask Dodge. But again, you don't want to make 500 horsepower. You want to barely make 500 horsepower. A good way to do that is to start with something relatively small, something proven and reliable, and something with enough of an aftermarket to fit your non-corporate budget. Something like the Honda K20. 
Stock block, we just have it bored out, some garden sleeves in it, stock crankshaft. We got some custom rods, we got some custom CP pistons. Head has been ported out. Uh, we use some super tech valves and springs. Spring rates, we shimmed up a little bit so we can make sure we hit a rev limiter without blowing the exhaust valves open, which has happened before. Uh, that's basically it. As race day approached, the weather was not getting any better. It was looking like the course might be shortened due to snow and ice at the top. I decided to brave the snow and freezing temperatures and camp on the mountain. If you're camping, you have to be through the gates by 6 p.m. Non-camping spectators are allowed in starting at 2.30 in the morning, and if you're not in line by then, it's going to be a couple hours before you get to your spot. I slept in the back of my rental car, setting an alarm for 2.30 a.m. when I drove from my camping spot at Ski Area up to Devil's Playground at an altitude of 13,000 feet. There were three other cars when I arrived. I put earplugs in and went back to sleep for a few hours before waking up to 500 new neighbors. And breakfast in bed. Unfortunately, the weather did not hold, and it was deemed that the top of the mountain was too icy and dangerous to run the full course. This was kind of a bummer. The teams are not only racing against each other, they're racing against the records in their classes. A shortened course means no chance to beat your class record. But the unpredictability of the mountain is what it is, and 2021 would be a short course. The hill is split into four segments, with the third segment ending at Devil's Playground. Bummer that we didn't get a full course, but I did end up with a great view of the finish line. The first cars to go were the Exhibition class. Leading that class this year was the unplugged performance Tesla Model S Plaid, driven by Randy Popst. The electric cars are required to run a noisemaker so that spectators know there is a race car coming. The Plaid had sound clips from the movie Spaceballs that they would occasionally just blast at full volume in the pits. Remnants from the pandemic has meant that all this shipping stuff is really, really tricky. Um, car was ready to... Should we pick another spot? <laughs> yeah. That's bonkers, yeah. This car was race prepped, but it was not a race car. They removed the interior, but all the body panels and glass were stock, save for some slight modifications. They added a splitter and a rear wing, some sticky tires, big brakes, and upgraded dampers. This car came in 10th overall, impressive considering how many purpose-built race cars it beat. We were hoping the weather would improve later in the morning, but it didn't, so all the cars would be running on the shortened course. Shoot would be the fourth driver of the fast cars. First up was Paul Dollenbach, who had set the fastest qualifying time. Dollenbach has won his class at Pikes Peak six times, and he won outright in 1993 while setting a new record time, so he's pretty quick. He crossed the line with a time of 6 minutes and 35 seconds. Cody Vashholtz and Raphael Astier followed behind, putting down times of 6.45 and 6.36. If Robin could keep his pace from practice, he would beat those times. If he could keep his car together, and if the weather on the mountain kept clear enough to see the turns at the top, he just might. It's a 126 flat for Robin Shute through the first section, and that is 11 seconds better than we've had so far. A 201.8 is his second section time. Again, that is over 10 seconds faster than we have seen all day, and Robin Shute's time should easily be the best so far. Just had the first time attack time, Robin Dumas through sector one. One, one minute, 38.2, which is very, very good. It's as good as Paul Dallenbach, but it's in turn 12 seconds slower than shoots. Phenomenal progress. Over the line now goes Robin Shoot, surely to the top. Yes, easily. It's a 5.55, so that is 40-odd uh, seconds faster than any time we've had so far. Well, that was remarkable. Every single sector was absolutely nailed. At the end of the day, Shoot's time of 5 minutes and 55 seconds was over 36 seconds faster than the next fastest car. A huge margin of victory. What if the full course had been run? What if Shute had a chance to compete for the overall time? Comparing his time in the first three sections to previous events, it looks like he might have broken the record for the fastest rear-wheel drive car. 
He might have been one of the fastest drivers up the mountain ever and a small group of legendary drivers who set their times in multi-million dollar cars developed by factory racing teams of huge automotive companies. But here's the thing about might have beens. Every team has them, several of them. If Reese Millen's Bentley hadn't developed a boost leak, he might have won the time attack class. If the NV8 hypercar hadn't suffered a mechanical failure, it might have been in the running for the fastest time. It's not really fair to compare sector times to previous years. The mountain is always different. The clouds, the temperature, the conditions of the road at the top would have put Shute's top section times slower than previous years, so it might not have mattered anyway. Next year, the Sendy Club is coming back, and they already have a better aerodynamic system designed for more downforce. The top of the mountain will be repaired by then, and the bumps will be gone, so it will be faster again. It will also be the 100th running of the event, so it's going to be something to watch. It could be that Shute comes back and takes the record for rear-wheel drive. He could possibly finish below 8 minutes. It could be that he or somebody else breaks the outright record. Could be, might have been, none of this really matters. At the end of the day, at the end of the race, the only thing that anyone is going to remember is who got to carry that checkered flag down the mountain. Robin, we've got a race to win, mate. Are you, are you, are you ready? I've not done yet.